A few months ago, my friend and I were walking back to his place from a party at around 3 a.m. We entered a rundown part of the city. Dark silhouettes disappeared into doorways as they saw us passing. Human predators who roamed the shadowy streets looking for easy prey and fresh meat. This area had lots of gang activity. Finding drugs here was easier than finding a bottle of soda. I kept my OC tear gas spray close at hand. My friend Cook had a wicked switchblade that he always carried with him wherever he went. I had only seen him have to use it once, but that memory still made me shudder. Smashed windows filled with shadows looked down like blind, dilated pupils. Tight alleyways wound through abandoned factories and apartment buildings. The eyes of countless scavengers gleamed white in the flickering streetlights. Rats scurried past overflowing dumpsters. Their tiny voices formed a symphony of squeaks and growls as they hurried past our feet on their way to eat garbage and rotting meat. We moved quickly through the streets. I felt eyes on me, both human and animal. Off in the distance, the faint echo of gunshots pierced the silence. As we walked, Cook told me about the newest urban legend he had heard. Cook knew about every conspiracy theory and urban legend under the sun. He seemed like a walking encyclopedia of almost entirely useless knowledge. I had previously heard rumors on some backwoods internet forums about a couple people who took a supernatural train that went through alternate earths and other, much stranger worlds. Apparently, only one returned alive, and he had been badly wounded and almost insane by the time he got back. They had never found the body of the other person. Cook knew the survivor personally and had even talked to him before his trip. Cook told me that this bizarre subway was called the Eldritch Tram by urban legend enthusiasts in the area. Neither of us liked being in this area of the city in the dark, though Cook knew it far better than me. I heard a tremble in his voice as he tried to project a mask of calmness and confidence. Not many people know about it, he said, glancing over at me with eyes the faded green of dying plants. A jagged scar ran across Cook's cheek from a knife fight he had gotten in as a teenager. He had on a black hoodie pulled down low over his shaved head. His shoes and jeans were also as black as coal. Other than his pale, thin face glowing white under the street lights, he looked like a dark shadow simply passing through the dead streets. Up ahead, a homeless man wearing filthy, tattered clothes lay swaddled like an infant in a pile of blankets. His glazed eyes stared blankly up at nothing. I glanced down at him, then quickly stepped back in horror. I saw he was dead, his throat viciously slashed from ear to ear. Blood pooled under his body, soaking through the dirty gray blankets and disappearing into the cracks of the litter-strewn sidewalk. Cook kept walking for a few moments, continuing to babble about how this one Urbex girl first discovered the Eldritch Tram a year ago by accident while exploring the abandoned Market Street substation. He hadn't even noticed my reaction or the dead body, only a few feet away from him. Cook, I hissed. He jumped slightly, whipping his head around to look back at me. I pointed to the corpse near his feet. His eyes widened as he finally took in the scene. A gray blanket filled with small rips and cigarette burns covered the dead man's body from below his chest to his ankles. As we took in the scene, I realized the blanket was moving. It looked like something small skittered under the surface, perhaps some scavengers feasting on the cold flesh. Cook reached down suddenly, gripping the blanket's corner with a tightly clenched fist. No, I hissed instinctually, not wanting to see, but it was too late. Cook pulled. The filthy covering slid off, revealing the ineffable nightmare waiting underneath. The homeless man's body showed signs of extreme torture and mutilation. Some psychopath had dissected the poor man's torso, pulling the skin apart until it reminded me of the open curtains of a stage. The homeless man's heart lay exposed, a red fist of gleaming, slick muscle. His intestines lay uncoiled around him like a den of dead snakes. Someone had neatly sliced off his hands and they were nowhere to be seen. A few rats gnawed at the cold, stiff flesh, disappearing into the mutilated folds of gore and bloody pockets lining the man's chest. 
Others pulled at the ragged strips of angry, red skin around the man's dripping stumps of wrists, squeaking and hissing at each other as they each tried to grab the tastiest morsels. I gagged, taking a step back and nearly tripping over the sidewalk curb. Cook stood there, shell-shocked, his mouth wide open. A strange, humming sound came from him, a kind of dissociated, uh. A cold, clear laugh rang out through the night. I immediately felt goosebumps rise all over my body as a figure stepped out of a nearby alleyway, a massive man who must have been nearly seven feet tall. He wore a silky, black robe that billowed around his bulging muscles. On his head, he had on a pointed black executioner's hood with two jagged holes cut out for eyes. He seemed larger than life standing there, looming over us. He held a blood-stained machete in one hand and an ancient revolver in the other. Cook came to life then, stuttering and backpedaling as he yanked his switchblade from his pocket, waving it in front of him as if it were a holy talisman able to hold back this evil presence. Run, Cook. I screamed. I turned, sprinting down the street as quickly as I could, without looking back to see if Cook would follow. A gunshot like a cannon blast exploded behind me, its harsh ring reverberating down the empty street. I heard Cook's shoes slamming the pavement hard behind me as another gunshot rang out. I felt a pain that was simultaneously cold, and burning radiate through my left arm. A stream of blood instantly began pouring from the wound. My arm felt numb, but I couldn't bear to look down. The subway tunnels. Cook cried out behind me as he turned into a narrow alleyway filled with overflowing dumpsters and more skittering rats. They're right here. Follow me, Justin. He sprinted ahead, veering left into another open street littered with broken glass and dirty needles. On both sides of us, I saw abandoned tenement buildings. Cook pointed ahead to a set of ominous concrete stairs. He sprinted down them with bounding steps like a madman, taking three at a time. There was no railing and they were slick with the brown trickles of polluted water, but with the amount of adrenaline coursing through my bloodstream, I had no problem following close behind at his heels. We descended down seven or eight stories. The darkness grew thicker and more oppressive as we got farther away from the street lights of the city. At the bottom, we found ourselves in a series of dark tunnels with dim bulbs strung every 30 or 40 feet feet along the ceilings. Cook seemed to know where he was going, so I followed close behind without saying much. As we sprinted for our lives, I looked down at my arm, my breath catching in my throat as I saw all the blood, but I tried to move it, wiping away some of the blood with a stained sleeve. With a flood of relief, I realized the bullet had only grazed the flesh. The bone wasn't hit and the bullet hadn't lodged inside the wound. The bleeding had already started to slow considerably, so I doubted whether it had hit any major blood vessels or arteries. Considering the circumstances, I considered myself extremely lucky. However, my arm continued to pound in time with my heartbeat, and I knew it would be sore for a while to come. Ahead of us, I heard a roaring as some giant mechanical heart shook the tunnels. Cook gave a triumphant roar as the dim, wet tunnel opened to a much larger one. I saw it was a subway tunnel. Echoes of a distant train roared throughout the corridor. Do trains run this late? I asked. This wasn't New York City after all. I knew our subways didn't run all night. Cook just shook his head, out of breath from running for our lives. I realized I didn't even have any idea what time it was anymore. Holy shit, what happened to your arm? He asked, looking at all the blood staining my long sleeve shirt. I got grazed by a bullet when that maniac was shooting at us, I said. We need to call the cops. Justin took out his phone, shaking his head. There's no service all the way down here. All the concrete and metal above us messes up the signal, he said, walking along the tracks. And stay away from that track. He pointed to the chunky metal one covered in a layer of protective shielding. It's electrified, it's got shielding, but I wouldn't touch it. The roaring in the tunnels seemed to get louder. Up ahead, I saw a concrete balcony open up on the left. I can't believe we ran into a total maniac, a serial killer probably. What the hell man? I just nodded, exhausted. My entire body seemed to ache as the rush of adrenaline faded. My arm shrieked at me with pain as waves of agony radiated out from the gunshot wound. Is that a station up ahead? I asked, gritting my teeth against the pain. Justin grinned at me, his face still pale and sweaty. His eyes looked slightly haunted and empty as he spoke. There's quite a few abandoned stations down here, he said. Those abandoned stations are where the urban legends about the Eldritch Tram always start. 
That'd be our luck, right? Getting chased by a serial killer and then seeing a psychotic ghost train. I pulled out my phone seeing it was already 3.33 a.m. We sat at an ancient, tarnished bench at the abandoned platform. Catching our breath, I looked around, seeing a tunnel with a metal gate pulled across it directly behind me. It sloped upwards. Before the station had been closed, it must have led up to the surface. The concrete started to vibrate as if tremors of an earthquake were passing through the tunnels. I turned to cook, trying to scream something, but I couldn't hear my own voice as the shaking exploded into a full-blown cacophony of shrieking engines and rushing air. A blur of something dark red swept in front of our eyes. Something wet smacked me in the back of the head. I jumped, spinning around. I saw Cook turn a second later as something pale blurred across the air and hit him in the chest. I glanced down, a sense of horror overtaking me as I realized it was a dismembered hand. The fingers curled up like the legs of a desiccated spider. I looked over at the gated metal passageway leading up to the surface. The hooded executioner stood there, but he wasn't hooded anymore. His pointed black hood must have come off sometime during his pursuit of us. Now a creature from a nightmare stood there, grinning like a demonic skull. His skin gleamed like marble, as hard and white as a statue's. Blue veins ran up and down his smooth, hairless head. He had no eyes or nose, only flat, pale skin extended across the top of his face. The bottom of it was split into a sadistic smile that revealed a mouthful of thousands of thin, black needles. His twisted fingers were intertwined in the vents of the gate. A rusted hole stood in the center, about the size of a basketball, and he began to rip at the metal. The train rapidly slowed behind us with a squealing of brakes and a low, groaning exhalation. A smell like wet mushrooms blew across the substation. After a few seconds, it stopped. I saw the train for the first time as I turned to run away from the abomination that hunted us so mercilessly. It was some strange combination of life and machine. Glistening red muscles extended across the outside of it contracting and relaxing in time with some giant hidden heart. Black veins intertwined like spider webs, running in fine streaks throughout the entire nightmarish, throbbing construction. Its wheels looked like regular steel. It had some sort of framework of metal under all that flesh. Its doors opened like a sideways eyelid with a sickening, squishing sound. The red muscles separated, dancing to the sides in slow, peristaltic bursts as a whirring of hidden motors opened the windowless steel doors underneath. The train went on as far as I could see in both directions, many hundreds of cars long. For all I knew, it could have been infinite. The engines quickly wind down with a low, groaning sound. It sounded like the exhalations of some giant dragon. The muscles all up and down the train relaxed at once with a flabby, spongy, sucking sound. At the same time, I heard the rending of metal behind us. I looked back, seeing the grinning, nightmarish face of the eyeless abomination slowly drawing near he was forcing his upper torso through the hole in the gate, looking like the world's ugliest infant forcing its way out of some rusted birth canal. The metal gate started to separate from the wall with the cracking of cement and the tinkling of crashing metal. I looked up at Cook with a growing feeling of mortal terror. Cook glanced at the train's open door in front of him, then back at the abomination. No, I whispered in horror, but we both knew we had no choice. The eyeless creature finished bursting through the gate as the metal gave one last rending sound. The abomination's gurgling, lunatic laugh reverberated throughout the empty station. It had no eyes, but I had the sense that it was looking directly at me in some way. This is your ride, friends, he hissed in a diseased, raspy voice, raising a bloody machete over his head and coming at us. Cook pulled my arm. We ran through the doors into that never-ending nightmare of a train. They started to slide close behind us with a steam whistle shriek from the writhing flesh all around us. The creature sprinted towards us as the doors closed. I saw his machete coming down, the sharp blade whistling through the air and throwing off spatters of wet blood in all directions. As the doors finally closed, the machete burst through, half of the blade still quivering in the contracting mesh of metal and flesh. Like the exterior, the inside of the Eldritch Tram was a strange combination of machine construction and organic matter. A rusted framework of rusted steel latticework could be seen behind the glistening, pink substrate that covered the 
the walls and ceiling. The organic substrate reminded me of lung tissue. It seemed to inhale and exhale very slowly as I watched it, like a slug flexing and relaxing its slimy body, rising and falling in cycles of 30 or 40 seconds. Beneath our feet, the train whined and groaned like a living thing coming to life. I heard the shrieking of metal wheels as they started rolling slowly forward. The throbbing of the flesh all around us pumped faster and faster, as if we stood inside the body of some Brobdingnagian sprinter. There were empty seats in this car. Black veins crisscrossed them, throbbing in time with some massive organic heart. They constantly exuded a thick, dark fluid that smelled like an infected wound. Rivulets of this fetid liquid slowly dribbled down the walls and onto the purplish-black tiled floor. I looked up and saw a map, partially obscured under layers of pink flesh and a webbing of black veins. Bright fluorescent lights ran overhead, illuminating this den of horrors in a white glare. They flickered in disparate strobes, sending eerie shadows reaching in every direction like greedy, black hands. Look, cook, I whispered, my voice giving out. He still looked stunned, as if he didn't know where he was, or how he had gotten there. He was hyperventilating, but his wide, unseeing eyes followed my finger. He looked up at the map, his face blank and uncomprehending. He looked like a shell-shocked soldier for a few moments, and I feared that perhaps all the stress had snapped his mind. He stood staring at the map for a long moment, then he grinned. I read the locations, not recognizing any of them. I can't believe it, Cook said. It's actually real. The Eldridge tram is real. I didn't really think it was. Can we still get off? I asked. Cook laughed at that, a high-pitched, insane sound. His smile looked strained and thin. I figured that answered my question. While most of the stops were covered in flesh or veins and were, therefore unreadable, I could make out some of the names. The stops were repeated in multiple different languages, but I didn't recognize most of them. Some of the scripts looked similar to Elvish, or the black speech from Lord of the Rings, while others had thin, spiderweb-like tracings forming repeating spirals and slashes. The second to last language was English. I saw a red dot tracing along the electrical circuit of the map, showing us our place. We had just left Market Street Station, the abandoned substation where the train had stopped. After that, I saw various places with bizarre names I had never heard of. Veridin, the Shadow Plains of the Collective Mind, and, second to last, Naraka. Most confusing of all, the words Ultimate Reality were emblazoned next to the dark light of the final stop. As Cook and I studied the line map with fascination, the door at the end of the car gave a low buzz. My head jerked over as the pink flesh dilated like a pupil with a squishing, sucking sound. The metal door behind the alien skin slid open, revealing a man standing there with a sleek, black rifle in his hand. He raised the barrel, pointing it at us. I instantly saw that it was not any regular rifle. It looked like something from a science fiction novel. Its exterior glimmered like obsidian, and it came together in sharp, triangular points all along the top and sides. The barrel looked like an active volcano, constantly glowing red and belching narrow trickles of black smoke. He had his finger on the curving, blade-like trigger. I didn't want to know what would happen if he pulled it. Don't move, the man said in a very strange accent, almost like some bizarre combination of a Caribbean accent and a Bostonian one. Cook gave me a nervous glance as I put my hands slowly in the air, not wanting to get shot by the newcomer. Who are you? What are you doing riding on the X-77? He asked. Are you agents of the collective mind? I quickly shook my head. Cook stood there, his mouth hanging agape, his hands limply held to his sides. My name is Justin, and this is my friend Cook, I said. We got chased by some eyeless abomination in a black robe. The only way we could save our lives was to get on the train. So the creature forced you into the train, the man said frowning. He had pale, almost colorless blue eyes. His face had a faint smile, but his eyes didn't smile. You would have been better accepting your fate, friend. There are fates much worse than death, and this train passes through most of them. The X-77, Cook asked, seeming unaware of the danger. He frowned. This route is the X-77, he said, pointing at the map. Looking, I realized he was right. Half covered under black veins and dribbling fluids, it read, X-77 line. You didn't really think it was called the Eldritch Tram, did you? I asked, smiling slightly. That's just something someone made up. I looked back at the man pointing the gun at us. 
The man's face looked hard and aristocratic with a straight, hawk nose, large eyes, and a thin, serious mouth. His clothes were strange. They reminded me of the dress of some backwoods Peruvian tribe. He had a hooded, dark brown poncho made of coarse cloth. Underneath, he wore plain black jeans and a long-sleeved shirt. His clothing almost seemed like a cowboy's. People call me brother, the man said. I smiled. Is that your name? I asked. Brother, he nodded. I have been alive for a very, very long time. I don't remember much of my original name. I've been on this train, going in circles, for the last 300 years. Cook laughed at that. The man regarded him stonily. What is that a joke? Cook asked. You can't be older than 40 or maybe 45. You expect us to believe that you've been alive for over 300 years. The man nodded grimly. Probably more than that, but yes. I have no reason to lie to you. Your opinion matters less to me than the scurryings of a rat. For most of that time, I have had to fight and kill to stay alive. The people from my world live to four or five hundred years. Or at least, they used to. For you see, I am hunted. I am an enemy of the collective mind, he said. What is this collective mind? I asked, curious, remembering how the map had said something about them also. It sounded like some sort of beehive or ant colony. I thought of giant bees flying around in spaceships and repressed an urge to laugh. A small smile crossed my face, but brother did not return it. His blue eyes regarded me without emotion, as blank and emotionless as the eyes of a mannequin. The collective mind is a species of beings who evolved in extreme conditions. Their world revolves around a black hole, and the life there hides deep under the ground in the blackness and slime. But over millions of years, they developed technology and spaceflight. They developed miracles, but only for themselves. For the beings of the collective mind do not have any advanced sense of individuality, but instead, they mostly exist as a collective consciousness, a hive mind. All of them are part machine and part life, hideous, hunchbacked, scurrying things about the size of a man that are horrible to look at. They have many blades strapped on their insectoid bodies and many eyes that see in all directions at once. You would have to see them for yourselves. I could not describe the horror of encountering the hunters of the collective mind. Mind. The agents of the collective mind find other species repulsive, inherently disgusting. They feel towards extraterrestrial life the same way you might feel if you had an invasion of sting bugs in your house or a horde of bed bugs in your bedroom. They consider all life forms not their own to be far beneath them. They would use you for dissection and torture. They would take apart all the parts of your body to find out how it works. Then they would find out what world you came from and go there. Then the horrors would really begin. For the agents of the collective mind have many toys at their disposal. Their investigation of alien life has given them some truly foul weapons. I saw it on my own planet. His eyes turned hard at this. I am the only survivor of a world that once held nearly 30 billion souls. The agents of the collective mind come to your planet and abduct men, women, and children. They subject them to the worst kind of torture, developing rabid biological weapons, superflus that cause people to bleed from their eyes, nose, mouths, and ears are skittering, monstrous creatures that burrow into the human body to lay their eggs. He shuddered slightly. He closed his eyes for a long moment breathing hard, as if trying to dispel some horrible memory. That was how my planet died. I saw my own mother and father ripped apart by some red, insectile monstrosity with giant black eyes. The larvae eat them alive from the inside, consuming their vital organs last, so as to keep them alive the longest. And they were conscious and awake until the end. It got so bad that I had to put a bullet in the heads of my own mother and father, simply to end their agony and terror. I killed both of them. I did it. I had to. Well, we're not going to run into these creatures, are we? I asked. I mean, we want to get back home. Cook nodded. This train does run in a circuit, right? It will return to the Market Street station soon, right? Cook asked, his face gleaming with hope. I knew Cook had quite a monkey in his back. He was a very heavy drinker, and when he didn't drink, he tended to get shaky and anxious. I figured this would be a very difficult trip for him. I felt a sense of relief that I had never gotten addicted to drugs or alcohol. Though, realistically, if we both got ripped apart by some nightmarish demons or sadistic alien species, it wouldn't matter very much. Soon, brother repeated, drawing out the word as if tasting it. 
I have no concept of time on this cursed train. I cannot say, we pass through many suns and many worlds. His words reminded me of the watch I wore on my wrist, an expensive brand given me to my father after my college graduation. I looked down at its thin hands, deciding to check the time, but the hands just spun in random circles. The hour hand had started spinning around backwards, while the second hand had frozen at the seven. The minute hand just twitched backwards and forwards in half circles, tracing the bottom half of the clock like a ticking pendulum. I swore under my breath, pulling out my phone. The screen had gone entirely black, despite the fact that I had just charged it a few hours earlier. No matter what I tried, I couldn't get any response from the phone. I wondered if some kind of strange magnetism was affecting electronic devices inside the train. It's not a good idea to stay in one place for too long, brother said abruptly. He walked towards us, beneath us the train hummed along its metal tracks, though whether those tracks had their roots on earth or in some strange black hole world, I didn't know. Suddenly, the flesh on the sides of the train began pulling apart, dilating like a pupil. Underneath, I saw rectangular windows. They were streaked in red slime and black fluid but I could still see outside. I gasped as I took in the horror of the scene. We were not in the city anymore. We were not even on earth. Outside, I saw bogs with black, swampy water, rounded growths of red mold jutted up in great spheres. Patches of ragged stone stabbed through the fetid water like giant daggers pointed upwards at the sky. On the rocks, I saw giant, centipede-like creatures with glowing white eyes. They looked about the size of a Great Dane. Their black, shining heads turned towards the train as it roared past, their eyes reflecting the pale effulgence from the sky like dull headlights. In the cloudless black sky above, I saw many rings circling the planet like the sharp, flat rings of Saturn. They extended far out into dark space, eventually becoming so faint, they simply disappeared from view. The stars twinkled all around them like tiny chips of diamond. Two pale, white moons looked down like cataract-stricken eyes. I quickly turned back away from the horrible sight. These are the boglands, brother said, herding us toward the door at the back of the train. Why do we need to keep moving? Cook asked. I saw his fingers trembling slightly. I wondered if he was just nervous, or if it was the first creeping signs of alcohol withdrawal. We are not the only ones in this train, brother responded, glancing back over his shoulder. He always kept his finger on the trigger of the strange rifle he carried, seemingly ready at any moment to begin shooting. There are far worse things than us. We had reached the back of the train. Brother pushed a small, round button labeled, automatic open. A door covered in a spiderweb of black veins stood there. It slid open. As the black veins lost their substrate, they evaporated into a fine dust before dissipating into the air. A gurgling, hissing voice filled every carriage up and down the seemingly infinite train. It spoke in some unknown alien tongue, then finally in English. Next stop, the Boglands. Passengers must disembark for 12 hours while the train regenerates its power. It hissed in a slow, demonic voice. Brother swore as the train's wheels shrieked. It started to decelerate. I looked up at brother in panic. Are they serious? I asked. We have to get out for 12 hours in this wasteland. Brother nodded, sighing. This is bad, he said. Dead things crawl out of the Boglands at night. I doubt we will have an easy time of it. With a steely glint in his eyes, he gripped the rifle tightly to his chest, ready for whatever would come. And though I would inevitably survive and leave that foul train, I would have many scars and remember this moment as the last bit of peace I would ever have. The metal doors we had come in through slid open with a shriek of tortured metal. The pink flesh thrumming over the interior of most of the train flexed. Like a slug, the flesh crawled to the side, leaving a streak of translucent clear mucus streaming down from the top of the walls. Let's go, brother said, ushering us forward into the dark wasteland. The alien sky above us glowed with strange, opalescent whirls of light. They reminded me of the northern lights, but these came in shimmering dark red, obsidian black and glowing silver. The black streaks twisting through the beautiful radiance above us had a different look than the darkness of space. They glimmered with a glassy texture, as if rivers of melted obsidian flowed out to the horizon. Whoa, Cook said, spellbound. Far out, man. His mouth dropped open as he saw the beautiful, effulgence writhing across the sky like a curtain in front of infinite space. 
Behind the twisting lights, the rings and twin moons of this strange world glowed faintly in the background. Brother pushed him forwards none too gently. Wait, I cried, running over to the next train over. The machete the eyeless creature had thrown at us had clattered to the ground when the doors of the train opened. I grasped it now, feeling the sticky, dried blood on the handle. It felt revolting under my grip. Good thinking, brother said, giving me what I learned was an extremely rare thing from him, a compliment. The ground beneath my feet looked like solid black earth, but it had a lot of give like a trampoline. At first it made walking a bit awkward. I looked up and down the endless track. The carriages of the train extended to the horizon, disappearing with the tracks in the far off cliffs and oceans of swamps that marked this world. I saw creatures that I would have never imagined, not even in my wildest fever dreams. Even now, a few months later, when I fall asleep in my bed late at night, I catch glimpses of those eldritch beings behind my closed eyes. They crawled, skittered, and glided out of the train's doors, emerging in waves. They were not remotely like any extraterrestrial life I had ever seen portrayed in fiction. The ones only five or six carriages down had dozens of translucent, black tentacles that writhed over the soft, spongy ground. Their bodies rose up like silver and black tree trunks to about eight feet. Their skin seemed to shiver and dance. They had dozens of boneless, slithering arms emerging from their chests. Hundreds of tiny eyes on stalks rose out of the tops of their heads like thin branches growing out of a tree. Each eye had a thick, glossy eyelid. They all blinked at different times, which gave the creature's expression a chaotic, otherworldly appearance. Some creatures further away looked like something from a demonic Alex Gray painting. They glowed with an inner orange light. They had two arms and two legs and a generally human shape, but no skin or recognizable face. I could see directly into the inside of their bodies, where many thin blood vessels spun around their solar plexus in fast, circular revolutions. The narrow veins swirled together with the orange light, spiraling like a hurricane of crimson and gold. From there, the pulsating red vein spiderwebbed out faintly, connecting to the ends of their fingers and toes. Each of these creatures seemed to have a dozen fingers and a single thumb on each hand. Their legs ended in feet like those of a rhinoceros. Their heads simply glowed with that uniform, opaque, orange light. I could see no sign of any eyes on their heads nor any place where they might possibly eat. My attention was roughly drawn back to our present predicament by brother grabbing me roughly by the arm and pulling me forwards. I saw Cook had also stopped yet again, staring open-mouthed at the strange creatures streaming out of the living train into the boglands. If you two idiots want to die, then be my guest, brother hissed through gritted teeth. But if you want to live, you better start moving. First of all, most of those creatures are not your friends. Those with the many eyes are called the stalkers, and those with the light shining from them are called the maya. The former will kill you and bleed you dry if you get too close, while the latter might just suck your consciousness out of your skull and imprison it within their minds for all eternity. And, secondly, when the train begins regenerating in about 30 seconds, it's going to start reaching out with those masses of flesh to consume anything it can grab around the tracks. Any native animal or plant life, any proteins or useful carbohydrates, it will suck up and incorporate into itself. After all, traveling through the multiverse is thirsty work, and the train is indeed a living organism, at least mostly. His words got me and Cook moving. We sprinted into the boglands and away from the train. Giant, red and white fungal growths as tall as redwoods loomed ahead of us. They had many mouth-like holes up and down their wet, crimson surfaces. White dots in the shape of perfect circles of varying sizes ran up and down their lengths. Thousands of these growths seemed to swarm around us after we got a few hundred feet away from the train. A thick mist kept me from seeing too far into the swamplands, and that made me nervous. Brother also looked anxious, and his eyes kept flicking to the left and right. Every few seconds he would check his back. I could tell he felt watched, as if sadistic, alien eyes were running over his body. I had the same creeping paranoia. The bogland smelled fungal, like a patch of mushrooms after a heavy rain. The pale cataract eyes of the twin moons gave enough light to see by, and this planet's alien version of the northern light seemed to run constantly across the sky at night. 
The trails split off into dozens of smaller trails, almost like deer trails. On the sides of the black earth, the swamps bubbled and gurgled as if they were whispering secrets. Cook was breathing heavily and kept asking to stop, grabbing his chest. Brother's eyes seemed as cold as liquid nitrogen as he regarded the complaining man. You can lay down right here and die, brother whispered slowly, his words dripping with venom. I don't tolerate weakness. I haven't lived this long to watch over a fully grown man children. Brother wasn't even winded. The man seemed made of stone, unbreakable. At that moment, I wondered if his heart was also made of stone. A terrible cacophony exploded from behind us, from the direction of the train. Cook and I jumped. I looked around like a caged animal, but brother just emitted a sardonic chuckle, pointing through the tall, mushroom-like pillars that rose all around us. I could still see part of the train through a gap in the flora. That is why we needed to get away, brother said coldly as Cook and I watched, open-mouthed and stunned. The entire train shone like a firefly, sending out strobing, blinding flickers of white light. The pink flesh all up and down had begun to shiver and vibrate. It sounded as if the entire train had started screaming in some high-pitched, alien tongue. The flesh had turned into groping, snake-like fingers that oozed off the sides of the train and prodded lightly across the ground next to the tracks. The fingers wrapped around anything they found. I saw a small, scaly, deer-like creature burst out of the thick forest of fungal growths, scared by the sudden explosion of light and noise. But the poor creature ran directly into the groping appendage of the train, which quickly wrapped itself around the alien deer like a boa constrictor. The finger of flesh slowly drew back to the train with its panicked, kicking offering. The creature disappeared into the flesh of the train, still fighting and writhing against the powerful muscles encircling it. Jesus Christ, Cook whispered, awestruck. The train's appendages continued prodding further out, breaking off huge chunks of the giant red and white mushrooms that loomed over the planet's surface and bringing them back to the main body. Other fleshy fingers broke off piles of black, glossy ferns. A few delved down holes in the planet's surface and came up with squirming gray lamprey-like creatures four or five feet long. It's just destroying everything around it. It's like a wrecking ball. How many calories a day do you think that train needs? I asked, jokingly, trying to break the tension. Cook didn't laugh. He had started visibly trembling. I put my hand on his shoulder. Are you going to be okay, man? Cook nodded, but he didn't look at me. He just continued to stare out blankly at the nightmarish train's feeding frenzy. We need to get moving. We need to distance ourselves from the train and from the passengers it brings, brother said dramatically, reaching into his faded jeans and pulling out a gold-plated pocket watch. He flicked it open. I saw a clock there, but it looked like it had 25 hours on it. Each of the numbers were marked in a strange language I had never seen before. They reminded me of Tibetan. We need to make sure we're back here in exactly 11 hours and 50 minutes. If the train leaves without us, we will be stranded and most certainly die a terrible death here in the Boglands. You're always so positive, I said sarcastically. Brother ignored my comment. Is there water here? Cook asked. I am thirsty as hell. He looked pale as well, but his comments brought up a good point. What do you do for food and water, brother? I asked. Do you just leave the train and hunt for food and water every time it stops to regenerate? The train gives pure water as a waste product from its feeding, brother said. I would not drink the water of the Boglands. I would not drink it for all the gold in Moria. Ah, shit. Cook said, licking his dry lips. I was also fairly thirsty and disappointed to hear the waters here were likely undrinkable. Why not? We had a few beers before all this insanity and I saw a man who drank the waters of the Boglands once, brother said, a distant look coming over his eyes. He entered the train afterwards. For a few hours, he was healthy and pink, not a scrape nor a sore, and then the parasite reached his brain. One of his pupils was huge, the other tiny. Blood started coming from his eyes, and he grew mad, raving and bloodthirsty. He started attacking anyone and anything he saw, like a rabid wolf, and that was when I was forced to kill him with my my boomstick. He raised his smoking alien rifle for emphasis. It is possible that not all the streams of the Boglands are corrupted such as this, but 
His story was cut off by a wailing cacophony close by on our right, maybe a couple hundred feet away. Brother's pale blue eyes widened and he spun, pointing his rifle in the direction of the scream. Another shrieking cry answered it from our left, even closer than the first. Brother pointed at us, then motioned down to the trail. We nodded. He took off and we followed close behind. All around us, dark shapes blurred through the brush, circling and shrieking. I couldn't tell how many there were. The path opened up suddenly a few dozen feet ahead. The huge fungal growths and sharp ferns of this strange alien landscape ended. A castle loomed there. Its exterior shone a glossy black, like smooth obsidian glass. It had no windows or openings except for a giant door at the front that streamed silver light across the flat, black plains. Something snaked out through the brush and grabbed my ankle. I looked down and saw a pale, rotting hand. A woman's corpse grinned up at me, her eyes filmy and wet. Her mouth slashed wide open from ear to ear. The mutilated skin of her face hung down in strips. I screamed as I fell, landing hard on the spongy earth. I twisted around, looking back at my attacker. She slithered out of the brush behind me, forcing me down with her body weight. Her yellowed, decaying teeth gnashed the air in front of my face as her sickly body covered mine. Get the hell off me, I cried, panicked. I still held the machete in my right hand as she lunged down to bite my eyes. I raised it up instinctively, stabbing her through the neck. Thick, dark red blood the consistency of maple syrup dribbled into my mouth and over my nose. I coughed, sputtering and gagging. Brother appeared in the corner of my vision. He reached down, ripping the woman's corpse off me with no apparent effort. With a strong, calloused hand, he pulled me up off the ground, hissing in my ear. There are at least twenty more of them closing in on us, he said. Run. He pushed me forward none too gently. I saw Cook sprinting across the field ahead of us. He looked like he was heading towards the castle. More lunging, limping corpses of the dead came out of the trees, all around the castle. I knew we had no choice. I ran towards the open door of the castle, seeing how its silver light streamed over the black plains like pale moonbeams through infinite space. As the three of us ran into the blinding glare of the castle, I dared to glance back. Dozens of corpses limped and sprinted after us, and only some were human. I saw rotting figures of what brother had called the stalkers, creatures with slithering tentacles and countless eyes on stalks. Except these stalkers had horrifying gashes across their bodies that dripped blue blood. Squirming white larvae writhed and danced in their open wounds, gleefully feeding on the dead flesh below. There surrounding us, brother cried in alarm as we crossed the threshold. The black soil turned into shimmering, glassy stone beneath our feet. We're outnumbered. We should try to find somewhere to hide in here, fast. What is this place? Cook asked, gasping and out of breath. Brother just shook his head. We will find out, he said. Nowhere good, I'm sure. But perhaps we can pass the majority of the next 12 hours in this refuge. It would be easier to secure a room and force our enemies to enter one at a time, than fight them in the open. The wailing and shrieking rang out fiercely behind us as the undead followed after their escaping prey. We entered a long, straight hallway with floating orbs along both sides of the wall. It was these many orbs that gave off such a blinding, silvery radiance that we had seen streaming out into the forest. Doorways in the shape of pointed arches opened up on both sides of us with slatted, gray metal doors. Brother seemed to choose one at random. He turned right after sprinting through the castle's hallways for a couple hundred feet. I looked back and saw a couple dozen of the creatures close behind us. The fastest of them was only a few paces behind us. My heart was beating like a jackhammer and I felt like I would pass out. My left arm had also started bleeding again after getting knocked to the ground and having to fight the undead woman. I winced as a sharp pain crawled up my skin, feeling the warm blood trickle slowly out of the wound. I was grateful that the eyeless monstrosity had not hit me in the right arm, however. I cried out something cold and moist wrapped around my arm. The door was so close, I tried pulling against the creature holding me. Brother heard my cry and spun around, raising his smoking rifle. Down, he cried, and I didn't hesitate. I fell to the ground, the creature still clutching my arm with an iron grip. 
Brother pressed the trigger, a narrow stream of what looked like molten lava shot out of the end of the rifle, blurring through the air like a fiery spear. I looked back, seeing what had grabbed me, a stalker with its many, rotted tentacles still dancing around its body. Its chest had been cut wide open, many small, black hearts beat there in the center of its torso. The loose flesh of its undead tentacles stayed wrapped tightly around my arm as the fiery projectile spread out over its body like napalm. The stalker gave a steam whistle screech that shook the ground as its rotting flesh melted off its body in suffocating smoking rivulets. I felt its grip loosen and jumped to my feet, following behind brother and cook. Brother pushed the door open, running through it without stopping. The hard metal slammed against the stone wall with a sound like a cannon firing. In front of us loomed a room filled with various torture tools hanging on the walls and cabinets hewn directly into the obsidian glass. I saw whips, saws, thumb screws, surgical instruments, knee splitters, head crushers, breast rippers, choke pairs, and other, even more insidious devices that I couldn't properly name. In glass jars, floating in some strange, yellowish fluid, organs and heads from countless species glittered in the silvery light. There were also chairs and beds in the room, all upholstered in some shiny red leather and embossed with a strange symbol. The symbol looked like a three with a long, curving tail jutting out to its right. Beyond all the torture devices and strange biological specimens loomed a staircase leading down into the darkness. No silver orbs illuminated this passage, nor did a speck of light shine out in that foul place. A sulfurous breeze blew up the steps from the hidden dungeon below, like the exhalations of some great, evil dragon. Help me move these chairs and beds, brother yelled, slamming the door shut. We'll barricade the door as best as we can. Cook and I moved to action quickly. The three of us slid the largest of the couches in front of the door just as the first set of hands slammed their full weight against it. The metal door shuddered in its frame as we continued to slide more furniture in front of the door. It jumped so fiercely with the many strong blows raining down on it that I feared the hinges might rip off. Cook and I were beyond winded and tired from our recent exertions. We were not used to running for our lives and sliding heavy furniture around on a regular basis. Cook bent over, shaking and anxious. I went next to him. What's up, man? How are you doing? I whispered. I need a drink, man, he complained. We'll get you some water when... No, I need a drink, Cook exclaimed insistently. I'm going to go into full-blown withdrawals soon. I've been drinking a little too much lately, I think. His eyes started to water as a single tear ran down his cheek. Brother heard the conversation and walked calmly over, regarding Cook with his colorless, stony gaze. That part of your life is over, Brother said coldly. If you get back to the squalid hole you call home, then you can drink yourself to death. But if you're here with us, you will fight and struggle, or I will leave you behind here to die. Weakness is death in these lands, and you seem to be overflowing with it, my friend. Cook's fists clenched at the unexpected insult. Fuck you, buddy, Cook spat. What do you know about me? You don't understand anything I've gone through. I've encountered many like you before, and they are all the same. Brother said coldly, they have let their demons convince their minds they are weak and small, and so they become weak and small, and fade into nothingness and death. Do not let your demons conquer you. You should use them to your advantage, not let them kill you. But if you wish to disappear from this world, then do not burden us with your sickness as you do so. Go find a hole, crawl into it, and die in peace. Or you can fight like a man and overcome that which destroys you. The blows continued to rain down on the door as brother offered his cold words of wisdom. The dark passage descending into the shadows stared up at us like the empty sockets of a grinning skull, revealing nothing of the mysteries beneath. Brother sat down and pulled out a flask of water and some dried meat from his pack. He passed the meager meal around. Cook drank greedily before passing the water to me. I took a long, satisfying sip. It had a strange, slightly soapy aftertaste, but otherwise seemed fine. I wondered if this was the water from the train. A sense of revulsion passed through me as I realized I was probably drinking the train's discharge from its prior meals. The meat brother offered was not any animal I had ever heard of. Brother said it was a calipari, a type of flying reptile the size of a large chicken who regularly got caught on the train when it stopped in whatever world the caliparis came from. They feed on the flesh of the train and drink its water, he explained. 
and they reproduce quickly, almost like insects. If you leave them alone for a few days in a train, you'll open the door and find hundreds of the things crawling over the walls. They are vicious with very sharp teeth, not at all friendly. They will swarm you like hornets if you let them, but their meat is very tender and soft. I try to shoot them and smoke the meat whenever I have a chance. At times, I have lived on calipare meat and water for months straight. I looked down at the gray meat. It was indeed very tender. In fact, it was falling right off the thin, twig-like bones. Brother continued to glance at the shuddering door, but it held firm. It sounded like an army was gathered on the other side by this point. However, we heard hundreds of gurgling voices hissing in many strange and alien tongues. The smell of rotting bodies flitted through the cracks of the door and filled up the room like a fetid cloud. Help, a voice echoed up from the dark passageway at the other side of the room, faint and distant. Please, help me. Is someone there? I hear voices. Please, God, if someone is there. The voice devolved into sobs and pained gasping. I looked over at brother who continued calmly eating the last of his calipare, stripping the tender gray meat off the bone. He threw the bones to the side of the room and stood up calmly. He gathered his pack and grabbed his rifle. Heaving a deep sigh, he looked at me and Cook. There's someone down there, Cook said, his face pale. Brother nodded grimly. Yes, I also have ears. Brother responded sarcastically. It may be another of your kind. They do speak your language after all. Well, so do you, but you're not from our earth, I said. Brother nodded. I speak 13 different languages and a few dozen more I know pieces of. I have traveled long. I have had time to listen and learn. The train has stopped at Market Street in your world for over a hundred years now. Always at night, of course. We have had many English speakers who cross the threshold of worlds at 3.33 a.m. This might be a trap, though. That's all I meant. I said, meeting brother's gaze. I noticed how silent everything had become, and then I realized the pounding at the door had stopped. For some reason, that only increased my creeping sense of disquiet. I wondered how much time had passed. I wanted to just get back on the train and relax, but that still seemed like an eternity away. Everything on these worlds is a trap, son. Brother hissed, his aristocratic features forming into a scowl. You should be prepared to meet death at any moment. Death is not your enemy, but a friend. It is nature's final painkiller, after all. After everything has grown old and gray, he motioned for me and Cook to follow him. Grab any weapons you wish from the walls. You will both need them, and soon if I had to guess. Cook and I went over to the stone cabinets, hewn directly into the rock without doors or latches. I still had the wicked, blood-stained machete from the eyeless creature, but I also found a small, sheathed dagger with a spiral pattern on the handle. The color of the metal blade was so light that it seemed to glow white. This doesn't look like any metal from Earth. I whispered to Cook, gazing at the embossed script across the dagger. It was a language I had seen on the Eldritch Tram, an elegant, curving script that reminded me of the black speech from Mordor. Cook glanced over at the dagger with interest. What should I grab? He asked, sounding like a kid in a toy store. His eyes gleamed as he looked at the various weapons and torture instruments. Whips with sharp barbs of metal at the tips grabbed his attention for a few moments. Cat o' nine tails glittered next to bloodstained chain whips and bull whips. Ah, uh, this one. He reached out his hand and took a beautiful, two-foot-long warhammer off the wall. It shone a silvery white with a roaring dragon engraved into the handle. On the head of the hammer, I saw that strange symbol again, the three with a curving tail attached to the bottom half of the number. Cook also grabbed a small, sheathed dagger hanging from the doorless cabinet. He slipped it in his pocket, and then we were ready. I'll go in the lead, brother said, starting off with a confident stride toward the dark passageway. Stay close behind me and watch our backs. We don't know what kind of foul evil or ancient traps await us below. Steep obsidian stairs led down into the darkness. Cook pulled a lighter out of his pocket, flicking it and illuminating the steps in front of us. Brother used the smoking, volcanic hole at the end of his rifle to help us see. There wasn't a single window 
window in the entire castle, so when the orbs that provided light ceased, the place became as dark as an underground cave. Smells like dead bodies, Cook muttered, in a tone dripping with revulsion. I noticed it too, every time a slight breeze blew up the stairwell. It smelled sweet and infectious, like a giant, open sore crawling with maggots. The voice had gone silent again, and now I couldn't even hear breathing coming from below. The black stairwell ended in a dungeon filled with prisoners, most of them dead. In the corner, slatted metal cages held three of the glowing, alien Maya. Their orange light gave the entire room a dull, flickering glow. Bodies of many strange species lay on tables, sliced open and dissected. In the corner, I saw a filthy, olive-skinned man chained to the obsidian wall. His long, dirty black hair had grown over his face, and a thick beard jutted down to his chest. He was unconscious, slumped and drooling. I noticed he had on a Johnny Cash shirt. More disturbingly, his right arm was missing from his body. The stump jutted out from his torso, cauterized and scarred. The arm lay on a table in front of him, severed and naked, the fingers spasming as the hand clenched and unclenched into a fist. I gasped, pointing. That, that arm, I sputtered, brother glanced at it, then his eyes widened. We looked around, seeing other dismembered limbs shuddering on other tables. Oh no, brother whispered, a tone of horror creeping over his voice. His stone mask of calmness cracked for a fundamental moment, and I glimpsed the broken, terrified man underneath. Someone has been using these souls and their bodies for the art of necromancy, a most powerful black magic. The chained man's eyes started to flutter. He raised his head, glancing from me to brother, to cook in confusion. You're not... He gurgled in a dry, reedy voice, coughing. It sounded like he had been gargling with lie. You're not the evil one. What? What are you doing here? Have you come to save me? Brother raised an eyebrow, drawing closer as Cook and I kept watch the myriad other forms across the dungeon. The caged Maya watched us silently, giving off the slightest smell of ozone as the light within their translucent bodies spun and danced. I felt drawn to them, as if that light were whispering in my ear to come closer. I blinked, pushing these intrusive thoughts away. I made a point not to look directly at the Maya again. Who is keeping you prisoner here, friend? Are you a criminal or a murderer? Brother asked. The man laughed, showing his broken, dirty teeth. He gave a grim smile. Aren't we all murderers here? But no, I am no criminal. I am a prisoner of the necromancer, the spinner of death. We are all his experiments, the man said. Brother nodded, seeming satisfied. He took the rifle and put its end up to the chain. He pulled the trigger, sending out a blast of fiery red lava. After a few seconds, the steel started to melt and drip. Brother yanked on the molten chain and the link ripped apart. I'm Cook, Cook said, and this is Brother and Justin. I'm Jeremiah, and I've been stuck here for six months, Jeremiah said, coughing up a wad of phlegm and spitting it on the floor. He looked thin and weak, his cheekbones prominent and his eyes deeply sunken. Brother broke his other chains and began helping him up. Cook started suddenly, his finger flying up and his eyes widening. Holy shit, Jeremiah, Jeremiah Matheson, Cook asked. Jeremiah looked up quickly, his dark eyes widening in surprise. How the hell do you know who I am? Jeremiah asked in a weak voice. I heard about the Eldritch Tram from your friend, Kyle. Everyone back home thinks you're dead, Cook responded. I remembered Cook telling me how two people had found the Eldritch Tram and that only one had returned, insane and rambling. He had told me the other person had died, but apparently he had been wrong. This is insane. What are the chances that we would find a survivor from Earth out here? I asked. Jeremiah shook his head. Better than you might think, he said. The necromancer is powerful. He might have captured you and brought you down here regardless, but then you would be in chains with me, not my rescuers. He gave a bitter smile at this. Brother took out his pocket watch, checking the time. The train will finish regenerating in about three hours, he stated robotically. I think it is time we start making our way back through the forest. We gathered our things and Cook and I helped Jeremiah walk up the stairs. The silence seemed deafening. We started to slide away the furniture blocking the door when an explosion rocked the room. Torture devices clattered to the floor with harsh bangs. A blinding purple light shot through the door like a cannonball. 
The metal door shattered like glass. The furniture caught on fire and erupted into violet flames and choking black smoke. A figure loomed there beyond the destruction, a shadow in the shape of a man. Bright whirls of fire spun through his tenebrous limbs. The shadows forming his skin shivered and rippled. His head looked like a black cloud with three sharp, protruding spikes on the top. Oh God, help us, Jeremiah whispered, his tanned skin growing pale as he began to tremble. His back hunched, and at that moment, he looked like a truly broken man. It's the necromancer. Brother fired his gun, sending out a fiery spray of molten lava that pierced the dark shadow like an arrow. The necromancer gave a reptilian roar, a blending of many shrieking voices together in a cacophonous scream. He pulled back, the shadowy silhouette disappearing from view. In its place, dozens of undead streamed in, limping and writhing their way through the shattered door and past the smoking ruins of furniture. Cook and I raised our weapons but my courage nearly failed then. I wanted to turn and run. The first attacker rushed me so suddenly though that I didn't even have time to think about it. It was a human female with a torn out throat. It looked like a pack of wolves had gotten to her, though, in reality, it was likely something worse. She gurgled and spat blood as she ran at me in a blur, her eyes rolling back in her head. I swung the machete as hard as I could, towards the massive wound in her neck. She sprinted right into my swing, and the sharp blade did its work quickly, decapitating her. I watched her head fly across the room. Her body stumbled towards me, falling and sliding as blood spurted from the stump of her neck. Brother kept aiming for those rushing in the doorway. I realized he was trying to create a bottleneck of corpses so as to keep them coming in one at a time. His weapon didn't seem to run out of ammo, so it seemed like it might work. Cook was fighting with a stalker that had wrapped its rotted tentacle around his leg. I watched the heavy warhammer smash into the stalker's many eyes, crushing its skull with a sound like a ceramic pot shattering. Jeremiah hung behind us, weak and stumbling, still clutching his mutilated arm. He looked like he might collapse at any moment. Brother's plan didn't work, however. Too many corpses kept flooding into the room, pushing us back further and further. We were surrounded on all sides. I saw the black, rippling silhouette of the necromancer as he walked in triumphantly. You will all die for your insolence, he cried in a voice like shadows. Kill them. Do not stop until they are all ripped to pieces. The necromancer loomed in the background as his undead puppets rushed us by the dozens. His dark abyss of a face revealed nothing, but his diseased, gurgling laughter did. Just as all hope seemed lost, orange light like a supernova exploded from the hallway. Far off down the corridor, I saw the creature's brother had called the Maya floating toward us, their translucent glowing bodies shimmering and spiraling in an eerie synchronization. The necromancer's laughter continued. In the heat of the battle, he didn't immediately notice the new threat approaching silently from behind him. The three of us continued fighting for our lives. As the Maya got within a few dozen feet of the necromancer, they raised their hands as one. A smell like ozone filled the air, and all the hair on my body stood up. The necromancer turned, sensing something off. When he saw the three Maya floating there, he gave a deep roar of fury. Golden electricity exploded from the Maya fingertips, sizzling the undead with their intense current. The walking corpses seized and kicked as current sizzled through their bodies. They fell to the floor like rag dolls, their bodies limp and motionless. A smell like searing steak filled the room. With a single backwards glance at his fallen army, the necromancer fled, roaring in anger. Two of the Maya followed after him in a blur, raising their hands. An arcing current hummed between their many translucent fingers, filling the air with a smell like ozone and lightning. The necromancer has kidnapped our breath. The remaining Maya whispered in a thin, hissing voice, You may go, and, without looking back, the four of us jumped over the bodies of the corpses and headed out of that hellish place. As a group, we ran back to the train. Cook and I took turns helping Jeremiah. He looked like he might collapse at any moment. The train sat, motionless and still. Its feeding frenzy had finished, and the doors stood open, welcoming travelers in. All around it, I saw drag marks and craters where the limbs of the train had ripped organic matter or animal life from the alien planet's surface. After a few minutes of waiting, the doors slid closed behind us with a squishy thud as the demonic voice came over the speakers, spitting and gurgling, saying, Next stop, 
the shadow planes of the collective mind. We will reach our destination in four hours. We don't have to get out again, do we? Jeremiah asked. Rivers of sweat dripped their way down his dirty face, leaving clean paths through the filth coating his skin. He shook and his tanned complexion looked muddy and pale now. I don't feel too good. No, hopefully not, brother said. The train only feeds once every few days. We will not need to get out on the shadow planes unless we are forced to buy something else. Aren't they going to see you? I asked brother. If they're hunting you and we're stopping on their planet, they might. Brother said unworriedly. It wouldn't be the first time. If they do, we'll stand and fight. They're not immortal, after all. I've killed dozens of those wretched, worm-like things. The train had rapidly accelerated until the boglands became simply a dark blur of fungi and empty sky. After a few minutes, when I looked out, I realized we had already left that world behind. Now it looked like an empty abyss outside the train. I didn't know when we had transitioned to this interim place, but I quickly realized it wasn't as empty as it appeared. There were waves in the shadows, as if an inky ocean the color of outer space rippled all around us. Strange creatures swam in the void. I saw eyeless, worm-like beasts the color of maggots who jumped up from the shimmering waves that stretched to the horizon. Other creatures with the faces like dragonfish and bodies like centipedes skittered over the surface of the black waves, their pale, glossy skin shining with some kind of strange, inner light. Up ahead, a tunnel of blinding white light spiraled at the front of the train. We were moving at such an amazing speed that, by the time I had seen it, we were already going through. It felt like flying into an exploding supernova. My ears rang with a high-pitched tinnitus. My eyes were temporarily blinded. All I could see were spots of color that danced over everything. I blinked fast, leaning against the warm, throbbing wall of the living train. I looked back out the window, seeing planes of black grass that extended to the horizon under a cold, dark sky. Currents of wind blew thickly through the grass, creating waves that traveled through the night like ripples in a pond. Outside, there was a high-pitched screaming sound, like the wailing of an infant. Looking up, I saw a black hole spinning and shooting out waves of curving, spiraling energy which gave the only light this strange planet received. What's that horrible sound? Cook asked, covering his ears and wincing. That's the native grass of the Shadow Plains, brother said. It cries like that constantly. I don't know if it's part of its feeding or its mating, but nearly everywhere on the surface, you hear the screaming of the kacha grass. That's going to drive me nuts, I said, shaking my head. I hope we get out of this place quickly. Well, we still have hours of travel left. Brother said grimly as his colorless eyes scanned the dark alien plane. The shadow planes are massive, many thousands of miles wide. The collective mind lives underneath the ground in subterranean cities that are hewn out of the cold rock of the planet itself. They were originally a species of tunnelers but like with humans, their limbs allowed them to manipulate tools and create technologies. In secret, deep underneath the shadow planes, they plotted and researched for thousands of years, strengthening themselves, fusing their consciousness with that of their computers, adding mechanical parts to their bodies until it became impossible to tell where flesh ended and machine began. Far off down the train, I heard doors opening with a squelching of flesh. I jumped, looking through the window, feeling panic squeezing my heart. Brother nodded, his face as calm and peaceful as usual, as if he were simply sitting in a restaurant waiting for his food and not in a den of horrors. I knew they were coming minutes ago, he said, raising his rifle. There's no running here. I heard something like gears whirring and a cacophony of siren-like shrieks. I caught a glimpse of what was pushing its way through the train in our direction and repressed an urge to scream. It stood about six feet tall, with a torso like the trunk of a glossy, black tree. Dozens Dozens of thin, boneless arms spiraled around its body with pointed gray blades on the end of each one. Long dark fingers like the roots of a tree twisted through the alien metal, clenching and writhing in chaotic movements. Hundreds of pale eyes on stalks gleamed like moonlight from the top of its head. 
I saw many thick, glistening wires like bright blue snakes wrapping around its body. In dozens of places, the wires ate its way into the dark creature's skin. The blue wires buzzed and lit up with beams of red and blue light that spun through them in a blur. It skittered forward like some sort of giant centipede on hundreds of shivering tentacle-like legs, each about the size of a pencil and a few feet long. Its mouth reminded me of the mouth of some sort of leech or lamprey, with countless tiny, muddy teeth buried in the sucking, wet flesh. I still had the machete gripped tightly in my hand when a monstrous, cybernetically enhanced creature gave a whine like a tornado siren. It sounded as if gears and wheels were spinning inside its body, as if a computer were loading with whirring fans. Then it began to speak in English, in a voice like a bullhorn. The carriages of the train rocked on their infinite tracks. Humans, you are in violation of Edict 7 of the House of Blades. Surrender immediately. Lay down your weapons, it blared. It repeated the message in German, French, Chinese, and some other languages as it drew nearer, slithering through the dozens of cars of the seemingly endless train. I didn't know what Edict 7 or the House of Blades was, but I figured none of it was good news. This strange cyborg now stood only a couple cars away and would reach us in seconds. Cook still held the warhammer he had stolen from the necromancer in his hands, and we both still had our small silver daggers stolen from the same armory. In my heart, I was hoping Brother's gun would simply cut the creature apart like lava and keep the rest of us from having to fight. I didn't know what kind of weapons these creatures from the collective mind might have within their cyborg bodies, though, or whether they could even be killed like a normal life form, seeing as they were part computer. With a steam whistle cry, the creature crashed through the door into our train. The door opened with a squelching of tissues and fluid. The many eyes of the creature focused on Brother and his smoking rifle. Brother raised it, calmly and smoothly aiming at the creature's head. Surrender, the thing screamed from its lamprey-like mouth, its many small teeth glistening. The sound also seemed to come from the wires wrapping around and eating their way into its body as well, amplifying with a whine like some sort of feedback loop. Brother bared his teeth in response, his face like a grinning death's head. Even the alien creature seemed to see the fierceness of the warrior's grimace. Pausing at the door to our carriage, its many slithering tentacles still writhing in place for a long moment as we surveyed each other across the no man's land. And though this happened months ago, I still remember the horror of that movement and how time seemed to stop when I lay in my apartment, not sleeping. The alien made its decision suddenly, but so did brother. Many things happened very quickly after that, with time like a rushing river pushing us forward. Brother pulled the trigger. A torrent of fire and burning, liquefied lava shot out of the end of his rifle, soaring through the air in a blur towards the creature's many slug-like cataract eyes. Brother's killer's eyes looked as cold as an arctic glacier as he attacked the alien beast. The wires wrapping their way up the creature's body and into its black flesh lit up like a flashbang, emitting a deafening boom and a flash of blinding light. I felt as if I were looking into a near-death experience for a few long moments. The faint screams of someone far away pierced through the ringing like a blade. As my vision cleared, I saw Jeremiah standing at the end of our group. A burnt, melting mass of liquefied fat and seared muscle. His body smoldered like charcoal. The smell of burning hair and cooking meat filled the carriage. He screamed, running in circles for a few seconds before collapsing to the ground, kicking and gurgling. The stub of his arm flailed blindly, his fingers clenching, his smoking eyes blank and horrified as he died. Even the alien flesh of the train seemed to shiver away from the heat and choking smoke rising up from Jeremiah's body. I saw something blue and glittery dripping down his body, setting new pieces of exposed gore on flames. I realized that the creature had fired some kind of napalm at us. The lava from Brother's rifle covered the creature's eyes. The pale, lidless orbs dripped and contorted. The stalks that rose up like the stems of mushrooms caught on fire. A sickly blue flame rose from the alien's flickering, melting body. A smell like burning rubber and scorched metal emanated from the dark smoke. It gave a scream like a woman being burned alive. A long, high-pitched wail that carried through the train like a tornado siren. Far off in the distance, I heard a faint sound. The same high-pitched banshee wailing being returned. 
Cook ran forward with his warhammer, raising it above his head. With an incomprehensible battle cry, he charged at the blinded alien. Its many arms whipped crazily around its body, the long black fingers connected to its many silver blades twisting and clenching in agony. Cook struck out at the nearest of the arms, shattering the limb with a sound like branches snapping in an ice storm. The alien's wires started glowing so bright and hot that I could feel the heat across the carriage. In a moment, blue, burning liquid shot out in all directions, spraying like molten metal across the train. The train's flesh pulled back, the pink, thrumming mass making a low, pained whispering sound as the blue napalm dripped down its surface with rivers of fire. Cook was sprayed on the foot and leg. Brother fell back and only got a few drops on his hand, while I felt my arm get splashed with drops of my own. Cook screamed in pain, falling back and rolling on the ground. Get it off, God, get it off, he shrieked, ripping at his pants and shoe. Fuck, it burns, it's eating through my clothes and skin. Help me, the pain was instantaneous for me as well. I bit down hard, repressing an urge to scream. My vision turned white with the heat of it. I smelled my own skin cooking, smelled the burning hair. The adrenaline spike gave me a temporary jolt that overtook the pain. I ran forward with the machete raised, slicing down in the middle of the creature's tree-like trunk. Its flesh split open and blue blood like that of a crab flowed out thick and sluggish. Brother walked calmly forward as the creature fell, not showing any signs of pain. He put his rifle directly to its burnt, wailing head and covered it in magma. The creature burned for only a few seconds before its screams started to fade and distort. They slowed down, grew deeper and more mechanical. I heard a whirring in its chest. A cloud of hissing hot gas spurted from the thing's blue wires, smelling of antifreeze and ozone. The high-pitched wailing of those cybernetically enhanced nightmares had closed in on us from both sides when the train's hissing gurgle of a voice broke through the fog of pain and terror clouding my mind. Next stop, the shadow planes of the collective mind. We will arrive at the central city of Sogoroth within five minutes. Brother's pale face seemed to go pale at the mention of the city. I looked outside into the wailing, obsidian grass of the shadow plains and the spiraling light of the black hole, ripping apart cosmic gas clouds in the sky. I realized that the world outside was not nearly as empty as I thought. Far off in the distance, windowless silver towers rose hundreds of stories into the sky, their shining exterior as sharp and tapering as a spike. Creatures like eyeless lions stalked through the rippling grass, their hides as tough and dark as leather. Instead of eyes, they had dozens of wet holes dripping with clear mucus in their faces that seemed to smell the air around them, opening and closing in a synchronized rhythm. The train had slowed with a squeal of brakes and a shower of sparks. The flesh all around us seemed to inhale deeply. A sense of rising pressure and humidity filled the living train. Brother looked at Cook writhing on the ground. The fire had gone out. Cook had ripped off his pants in an attempt to stop the alien napalm from eating its way directly through his body. Deep, angry red welts surrounded blackened and charred necrotic tissue eaten deeply into his flesh. He breathed hard, his face red. The scar from the knife fight he had gotten so long ago shone like a white grimace across his cheek. He pulled himself up into a sitting position, leaning heavily against the wet walls of the train. What are we going to do with Cook? I asked. I glanced over at Jeremiah's charred, dead body, feeling a sick sense of revulsion rising through my chest. Brother's cold, colorless eyes surveyed the carnage. We may have to run when the doors open, he said. Hopefully, they'll follow us. The train usually stops for 30 minutes or so here, as there's a lot of travel from the Shadow Plains. They sometimes use the train to find new worlds to invade, new species to conquer and dissect and study, and eventually exterminate like rats. I looked out into the cold world of this black hole system. Can we even survive out there? I said. It's cold, but yes, we can survive. Shit. Brother swore, shaking his head. Everything's going wrong. The House of Blades. He sighed, his face lined with countless years of struggle and battle. That's the most powerful organization on this planet. The military elites of the collective mind, I guess you could say. I think we have a major problem on our hands. If they find us. What was that screaming that thing did? I asked abruptly, not wanting to know what would happen if we were caught. It was calling for help. 
He answered, and help is on its way, but not for us. As if to emphasize his words, doors far away from us on both sides slid open, the sound faint and distant. I peered through the glass, seeing more of those monsters from the collective mind slithering through the living train, their many pale, lidless eyes searching and wide. The train's wheels squealed to a stop, locking up with a deep exhalation of breath. The fungal smell from the pink flesh and black veins spiderwebbing across the walls increased abruptly. I felt the train rapidly decelerating under our feet. Through the blur of motion outside the mucus-streaked windows, I saw a system of glowing, blood-red roads winding their way hundreds of stories up into the sky on thin stilts. Other roads tunneled deep into the ground. Constant traffic of what looked like giant, egg-shaped pods traveled across them in a blur. Thousands of the windowless, silver towers loomed on the horizon. Behind them, a few enormous ships that looked almost like dragonflies flew up into the coldness of space, while others descended, falling down from the bright chips of starlight with a fluttering of opalescent wings. The wings stretched out hundreds of feet in both directions, as narrow as glass and filled with throbbing blood vessels under the translucent, shimmering skin. Like the aliens of the collective mind themselves and the train we traveled on, these dragonfly ships looked like some mesh of machine and flesh. From the tails of those ascending came gouts of blue flames, as if they were space shuttles on their way to the moon. Like some sort of blimp, the alien ships had carriages made of a glossy, obsidian-like material connected to their chests, where I figured the passengers or cargo of this strange, alien civilization must travel. I saw the glittering of metal combined with fine, translucent veins on these enormous things. I wondered if perhaps the collective mind had even created the living train called the X-77 in the first place, using the same kind of technology. If they had, they were advanced far beyond anything I had imagined. Humanity would stand absolutely no chance against such a species. I shuddered to think of what would happen if they reached Earth and found a world full of new subjects to dissect and conduct their horrific experiments on, before ultimately exterminating the whole species like an infestation of bugs, just like they had done on Brother's Planet. I didn't get to wonder about it for long when the doors at the end of the carriages opened with a whirring of gears. At the same time, the train came to an abrupt stop, its doors pulling apart, the black veins disappearing like dark dust in the frigid air of the shadow planes. Behind us, Cook continuously moaned in agony, his destroyed body smelling like napalm and burnt hair. Run, Cook cried in a croaking whisper, Justin, you and brother need to get away. At that moment, the hunters of the collective mind oozed over the thresholds like alien centipedes, the many electronic components built into their bodies whirring and whining. Their countless unblinking eyes scanned us and the dead body of their comrade with a look of impassion. Brother did not hesitate when he saw the enemy. He pulled my arm and yanked me out the door. As we sprinted away, he turned, firing a blast of light at the closer of the two hunters. I glanced back, seeing it land on the abomination's black flesh with a sizzling sound and a dripping of fat. It gave a shrill, banshee-like wail, which was answered all up and down the living train a few moments later by countless other hunters. Brother's plan worked. Both of the hunters from the collective mind slithered out of the train in a blur after us, leaving the burnt, moaning form of Cook propped up against the fleshy wall. His eyes looked glazed, as if he didn't even know where he was or what was happening. He was seriously injured, and I wasn't sure if he would make it back in the shape he was in. We sprinted out onto a road that looked like it was paved with some red volcanic glass. It split off into dozens of smaller branching paths that tunneled into the ground, deep under the screaming of the grass and the spiraling black hole of the sky. The hunters moved at a superhuman speed as brother chose one path at random. I heard them behind us, their wet, slimy bodies giving off gurgling breaths. They rapidly closed the distance. The red path narrowed into a tunnel only wide enough for brother and I to run in single file. Brother abruptly stopped, motioning me forward. Keep running, he said, turning to fire another round at the hunters. To my horror, I saw they were less than 20 feet behind us now. At this rate, they would catch up with us in seconds. 
The black smoke belched from the end of the obsidian rifle as he sprayed another blast of lava at the closer of the two hunters. The one with a mass of still smoking, burnt flesh on the front of its tree-like trunk. It saw brother with its many lidless eyes and gave a wail of surprise. Its hundreds of long, skittering legs pushed it up into the air. Its blue wires suddenly shone with an explosion of light. More of its cobalt blue napalm shot out of sizzling holes that opened up like screaming mouths all up and down the wires spiraling around its body. Brother's fiery round sprayed the hunter behind it, covering the front of its legs. It fell forward with a wail as its legs melted, the flesh ripping open under the tremendous heat. The nearer of the hunter's spray hit brother in the arm. He stumbled back, following after me with a grim set expression. His stony face showed no signs of pain, even as I heard his skin sizzle like bacon and give off thin wisps of grey smoke. Go, he yelled, pointing forward into the darkness and the unknown. Without hesitation, I sprinted ahead, my body sore and exhausted, my arm still gouged from the bullet wound I had gotten when I was first chased on the train, countless burn spots eaten into my skin, and yet, I knew I was incredibly lucky to even still be alive. The tunnel quickly sloped down like the trail of a mountain, the road hanging over the massive chamber of dark, empty space that opened up for hundreds of stories beneath us. The alien hunter in front still trailed closely behind us. It gave its eerie banshee shriek. I heard responses from all around us in the darkness, including not far ahead, up on the floating crimson road. Brother glanced backward and forward with a grim expression in his colorless eyes. I saw we were trapped, surrounded on all sides. They would either burn us alive right here and now, or take us to some cold alien laboratory where they would dissect and torture us like medical experiments in some death camp. Do you trust me? Brother murmured in a barely audible voice, grabbing my arm with a grip like iron. I nodded. Before I knew what was happening, he pushed me over the edge of the road. I fell back, my arms windmilling, a silent scream suffocating in my throat. Still holding onto my arm, brother jumped over the edge after me just as the hunters of the collective mind reached us. As we fell through what felt like eternal space, I felt a blind animal panic take over, exterminating all rational thought. I saw there was a city thrumming and vibrating thousands of feet beneath us, the place the train had called Sugaroth. Great towers, shaped like spiraling blades made of glossy black and red volcanic glass loomed hundreds of stories, their many circling windows giving off a pale, white glow. My mind wouldn't register what I saw until later however, when I looked back with a more dispassionate and less terrified eye. Clusters of hunters from the collective mind were gathered in circles. Hundreds of the black, writhing creatures huddled tightly together in groups, screaming up at the dark stone sky in harmonizing shrieks. Artificial lights gave off a white radiance that shone across the seemingly endless cavern. Soft fungal root systems wound their way through the air like spider webs, each glowing with a pale silver like moonlight. The air whipped crazily all around us. I looked down, realizing we were falling right into the web of roots. Before I knew what was happening, they were all around me like narrow tree branches, grabbing at my body. I felt a scream sucked out of my lungs as we tumbled through the thin strands that reached out and caught us like grasping hands. The narrow roots slowed our descent. We fell into tangles and knots, breaking through one layer after another until we finally found ourselves stopped. Like flies in a spider web, we were trapped thousands of feet above the ground. My heart slammed over and over in my chest, the rapid beat ringing in my ears. I had thought I was dead. The sheer animal terror of falling still shook me to my core. Trembling and weak, I could only lay there on the fungal roots, hyperventilating and praying. I looked down at Sugaroth far below us, my stomach flipping with vertigo. Brother and I were caught in the filaments as if they were tightly wound strings of rope on some nightmare marish rope course, except I doubted that any rope course would have a drop of hundreds of stories onto the flashing, strobing city of the collective mind. We need to get back. Brother gasped next to me, looking more shaken than I had ever seen him. He gulped hard, looking around, as if expecting to see another vision from a nightmare perched overhead. Yet, as far as I could tell, we were safe for the moment. As long as the roots didn't give out and cause us to plummet to our deaths, I gazed at him in amazement. Back, I asked, confused and stuttering. I tried not to look down for too long, otherwise everything started spinning. 
to the train. He nodded grimly. The X-77 only stops here for about an hour, brother said, his ticking, golden pocket watch flashing in his hands for a brief moment. It was the one with 25 hours on it that I had seen on the train. It isn't like the Boglands where it must regenerate its energy. I've seen the hunters from the collective mind loading up cargo and supplies on the X-77 train, which is probably the only reason it stops for as long as it does. I don't know where the cargo goes, but thankfully, the train stops here longer than it does in the other worlds, like Naraka or Victoria. So what do you propose? I hissed through gritted teeth, looking around at the empty space that surrounded us all on sides. Do you want to just fly away? Because as far as I can tell, we're stuck. I looked around grimly, seeing the bottom of the crimson road hundreds of feet overhead. It was so smooth and glass-like that I could see a reflection in it. Everything in its reflection became red like blood, as if it were a mirror that showed the absolute reality of death and murder all over the universe. I have something here, brother murmured. He frantically brought his small, leather satchel he always wore between us and reached inside. Brother's eyes flicked constantly, glancing up at our torturers on the crimson road and down at the city of Sugaroth far below. What are you looking for? I asked, still feeling sick from my fear of heights. If I kept my gaze fixed on brother and kept him talking, I didn't notice the endless drop beneath my feet so much. It was like standing on the edge of a skyscraper at night and looking down 100 stories the flowing traffic below with a shrill wind whipping all around me. Brother didn't respond, however. The look of intense concentration remained plastered across his thin, aristocratic visage. The many lidless eyes of hunters gazed down at us from the road overhead. Even though everything about them seemed alien, I could have sworn I saw an expression of hunger reflected in their eldritch faces. The granite walls of this subterranean city stretched for miles in every direction, as smooth and free of handholds as smooth glass. I knew we would not be getting up that way. Brother's hand came up with two coiled lengths of rope. The rope looked like something futuristic. It looked as yellow as gold and shimmered like metal. He carefully handed one over to me. These creatures exist primarily as a hive mind. What one sees and thinks, the others can all gain access to. The entire city will be looking for us soon, brother said. All of the hunters can access the memories of their comrades, even the dead ones. Within their bodies, they have something that records everything. We need to find a way back to the train and get out of the shadow planes before the hunters all organize. We need to start climbing somehow. My stomach dropped at the thought. Climbing an unsecured rope of some unknown material with no safety harness three or four thousand feet above the ground seemed like something from a nightmare. I felt a sudden urge to retch just thinking about it. No, absolutely not. I said, breathing faster. My vision seemed to turn white with anxiety. I am not doing that. No fucking way. I hate heights. Brother looked coldly over at me. Then you can stay here forever, he said, a flash of amusement coming over his eyes. It will be a fitting death for someone afraid of heights, yes. You can just starve and dehydrate over here by yourself, or wait for someone from the collective mind to come grab you. As if the universe had heard brother's words, I heard a dissonant worry sound far below. It sounded almost like a helicopter, with a kind of rhythmic whooping that faded and grew in cycles of a couple seconds. I had no idea what I was hearing at first, but the shard of dread that pierced my heart told me it was nothing good. I looked down, seeing one of the alien dragonfly ships soaring straight up towards us. Gouts of blue flame shot from its tail as countless fans whirred inside its body. Like the hunters of the collective mind, these dragonflies had both organic and and machine parts. On its torso, I saw a black, obsidian box fused into its skin. A slit in the box covered with some sort of tinted glass allowed me to see what lay inside. Hundreds of eyes on stalks stared up at me and brother from the box without any shred of emotion. The dragonfly flew up at us with a predatory hunger in its dragon-like face. Its eyes looked as pale as cataracts, opaque and filmy, the white gleam looking as pale as moonlight. Its wings looked as light and fragile as a thin pane of glass, translucent and filled with throbbing rivers of red and blue vessels. The dragonfly's long, tapering mouth opened with a cry, like a tornado siren. I felt my heart drop as I stared down at the approaching messenger of death. For now, my fear of heights was forgotten.
A new fear, far more sharp and urgent, stabbed its way through my heart. This is our only chance, brother said without a hint of fear. He took his rope, tying the end into a large lasso. I didn't understand how he stayed so calm. I was so filled with mortal terror that I could barely remember how to speak. Get your rope ready, damn it. I jumped, looking down at the rope. With shaking hands, I grabbed it, following brother's lead and tying a large lasso in the end. I triple knotted it, not knowing what his plan was, but figuring that our lives depended on it. The dragonfly was only a couple hundred feet below us by this point. It would reach us in seconds. Its wings battered the air furiously as it ascended, showing off thousands of protruding, needle-like teeth in its reptilian mouth. Brother took me by the arm with a grip like iron. This is our only chance, he hissed. Get ready. With his rifle slung around one shoulder, he took his rope and began swinging it in circles, gaining momentum for the lasso. I did the same, but I had no experience with rope or lassoing livestock. I wasn't a cowboy, after all. Time moved so fast though that I never got the chance to question it. Before I knew it, brother had flung his rope. The steam whistle cry of the cybernetically enhanced predator roared from directly below us as it blurred through the spider webbing of thick fungal roots growing out of the smooth granite. The roots dissolved into a cloud of spores and dust beneath us, and suddenly, there was nothing between me and the ground except cold, empty air. A moment after brother, I threw my lasso at the creature and prayed. My lasso did not land anywhere close to the massive alien dragonfly. I heard a deep, booming chortle from the creature as if it were trying to laugh. And then I felt myself falling as the last of the roots dissolved under the dragonfly's attack. I screamed, knowing I had lost. In that moment, I knew I would die. I could only look down at my fate as everything inside my chest squirmed and rose like pure, distilled anxiety. My feet tingled as if butterflies flew underneath the soles. A hand came down and grabbed my arm with a grip like iron. I couldn't look away from the drop, however. Help me, you fool. Brother screamed. I looked up as he started to pull up, the grip he had on my arm slipping. I began to slide back down. With a wave of adrenaline I have never felt before, I reached reached and hugged his body with every ounce of strength I had. Then we were rising into the air at a tremendous speed. I clung to brother's body, but felt myself slipping. My sweaty palms could barely support me. I tried grabbing his waist, but we were moving up so fast that I felt myself slip down a couple more inches. Frantic, I dug my fingers into the cloth of his poncho, hoping the material would not rip and send me falling to my death. I glimpsed the rope brother had thrown caught around the alien's dragon-like snout. The creature shook its head like a dog with a toy, trying to throw us off. I watched in horror as its mouth opened, the rope snapping apart with a popping sound. Then both brother and I were falling. I was screaming. Brother's eyes had rolled up in his head and gone white. Everything was moving so fast that I wasn't even sure where I was anymore. I only knew we had failed. A moment later, my body hit something hard. I rolled, feeling something in my left shoulder give way with a crack. The breath was knocked out of my lungs as I shrieked in agony. Brother was suddenly standing over, pulling me up. Blood streamed from a gash on his forehead as he pointed below us. We did it. He told me excitedly. We landed on one of the roads. The train will be leaving soon. We need to get back immediately. Still stunned, I barely comprehended the words. Brother knelt down and slapped me hard across the face. Get up, run. Do you want to stay here forever? Groggily, I rose to my feet and followed brother out into the cold blackness and screaming grass of the collective mind. We sprinted down the bloody glow of the smooth alien road. The train in the distance still had its doors opened. I realized with some slight amusement that we had returned to almost the same exact spot we had left from. As we got closer, I could even see the burnt, blackened body of Jeremiah laying still and cold on the blood-strewn floor. Next stop, St. Joseph's Stand. We will reach our destination in approximately seven hours. The train gurgled in its low hiss of a voice. The words echoed through the cold, dry air of the shadow planes all around us. 
To my horror, I saw Cook missing from the carriage. Where he had been sitting, I saw a puddle of gore and a warhammer covered in blood and pieces of skin. Ruby red drops let out the door like breadcrumbs, smeared across the floor of the train as if something had dragged him away. Bloody handprints covered the wall and door. I could almost see what had happened in my mind's eye. Cook trying frantically to keep his attacker away with the meager warhammer, his injured, withdrawing body filled with terror and pain. The hunter from the collective mind wrapping one of its slithering, snake-like tentacle legs around Cook's leg and dragging him away. But to where? To the horrors of the dissection chamber deep in the supermassive skyscrapers of Sugaroth. In the end, I would never find out. In hindsight, I realized that was probably for the best. Finally, mercifully, the doors of the train closed. The living train slowly gained speed, heading towards its next destination in its never-ending circuit across the multiverse. We took off across the dark wasteland of the Shadow Plains with the screaming of the dull, jet-black kacha grass surrounding us like the shrieking of an erupting volcano. Brother turned to me, his eyes cold and distant, his lips tightly pressed together. Sighing deeply, he slung his rifle around his body and patted me on the shoulder. I'm sorry, Justin, brother said, a genuine expression twisting his face for the briefest fraction of a second. I'm sorry about your friend. Do you think the collective mind is experimenting on him? I asked, horrified. What if they use what they learn from experimenting on Cook to attack Earth? Brother just shook his head. We can't change that now, he responded grimly. All you can do is prepare yourself for whatever may come. After we had escaped the shadow planes of the collective mind and the hunters from the House of the Blades, the danger on the train seemed much less. Brother and I were the sole survivors and while we had to watch our backs due to the plethora of strange and often hungry alien creatures inhabiting the train, we saw no more hunters from the collective mind after that. We didn't end up having to kill more than a couple dozen monstrous creatures on the train in the next few weeks, a number which brother seemed to find dull and underwhelming. He lived on the thrill of the hunt after all, which was something I found out more and more as I got to know him. We passed through many more worlds, living on the water of the train and calipare meat for weeks at a time. I saw the fiery cliffs of Naraka, where millions of naked people swarmed above the rivers of fire and lava that rained from the sky like constant streams of hail. I remember Veridin, where the tall humanoid creatures had legs that bent backwards like the legs of a bird. Eventually, we passed through the last of the stops, the one labeled Ultimate Reality, as the front of the train disappeared into a vortex of spinning light. I saw brother's eyes gleam with a strange kind of existential terror. God, I hate this place, brother murmured to himself. A moment later, our carriage flew through the radiant gate into that other world, the eternal moment at the center of all things. I tried to scream, but it seemed like the sounds moved in hundreds of spatial dimensions, writhing backwards and forwards in time like ripples on a pond. The train began to peel away all around me, layers of metal and pink flesh ripping away as if in a hurricane. Brother's skin disappeared as if it were being eaten by a corrosive acid. Then his muscles started to fade away until he stood there, a skeleton with a chattering mouth. A tunnel of light with millions of lidless, staring eyes formed at his heart, spiraling all around us until they formed a wall of pure consciousness rising up into infinity. I looked down, seeing my own body peeling away in layers. Soon I only saw the light spilling out from my heart. And in that moment, I forgot who I was or even that I was once human at all. Revelation like a tsunami shattered my mind and all illusions shattered with them. I saw reality from the viewpoints of all beings in all moments of time. A sound like a cosmic gong rang and shook everything beneath the many layers of reality. These countless layers shimmered like mirages above the eternal, timeless moment at the source. I saw universes created and destroyed in the blink of an eye as a deathless self looked out from every heart, seeing all moments of time but not imprisoned within it. Worlds were destroyed by civilizations, alien and human alike, and I saw into the minds of the killer and killed. Mountains of corpses collected and rotted all across space and time, but inside the heart of everyone, I saw the same consciousness peeking out, the deathless self like a trillion omniscient eyes. 
It existed outside of time, existed purely of eternal bliss and peace, and, while seeing everything, it never experienced the suffering of these many beings passing through the mirage of this strange universe. Always, it lay beyond. I saw into the deepest hells opening like worlds of lava far below me, and found the light of the self there, too. Even during trillions of years of endless agony and suffering, it stood like a deep well of peace, untouched and tranquil. And then we were through, and I was falling and gasping, looking over at brother. He lay on the floor, sweating heavily, his eyes wide. Yeah, it's the same every time, he said, wiping his pale face and standing up. Same goddamn thing every time, but it fades rapidly once you're through. In a few hours, you'll barely remember what happened there. I could only stutter, confused as to who I was or why I had a body at all. The glimpse of ultimate reality rapidly faded, however, and within a few minutes, I could barely remember what I had seen. It wasn't long after that, the living train pulled up to Market Street substation with a deep exhalation, as if the train itself were sighing in relief after a long journey completed. The brakes squealed with a high-pitched cacophony. Floating on clouds of bliss, I glanced back at brother one last time, seeing his lined face and ancient eyes. He was a true survivor, a killer, a kind of man I'd never before encountered, and likely never would again. He raised his hand, his face still stony and grim. I gave him a faint half-smile as I turned away. At 3.33 a.m., I stepped off the X-77, the sole survivor of all those who wished to return. But I still carry all their stories in my heart as I go forward.